Welcome to SIM Platform, the place where academic knowledge meets the practice world to foster a critical discussion on what platforms are, how they work, and what they can become for people, organizations, and our society. Well, I think many of uh, what we'll be saying can build on what Pinar was, was presenting. We'll talk about data and we'll talk about uh, the business model implications or opportunities that these data are, are actually opening for companies. And I, we would like to start this, uh, this presentation with a number, a number that is 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. That's the number of bytes that uh, we create daily. This is a number that became pretty popular over the last years that in my opinion is extremely fascinating. We create data literally anytime. In this moment, we are creating a lot of data because we are recording, because there are many cameras open, because there is a mic open. Since the COVID-19 actually appeared, I think that the number of the amount of data increased even more. And I do believe that for many of the people listening, probably this number is huge, but I don't know how many people can say how huge it is. Well, let me say something. It means that it has 18 zeros, okay? It's an enormous amount of data that we create continuously. And probably there is something more that worth to be said. This is a very old number. This is a research done by IBM in 2012, almost 10 years ago. This number is probably extremely small in comparison to what we are doing right now. In 2012, Spotify, Netflix, even Amazon probably, were definitely not spread as they are today. Obviously, we were already in the digital world. There were already many digital apps that were surrounding and supporting many of our daily activities. Still, what nine years ago seemed an enormous number, today is probably small and made the opportunities and the challenges that we were living back then, something that is extremely bigger. And to you know, highlight this idea, we picked a picture that says data as a better idea. There are many metaphors that can be used behind this. Metaphors that goes from uh, data as the new oil, the new resource that is so valuable, that has this price going up and down continuously and moving even the political power among different countries. I don't know if we are already there, but probably we are getting closer, extremely closer to an era in which data are actually influencing and changing what is happening in the real world and not just in a digital service. And you know, I do believe there is uh, an example that can very easily show what I mean. And that's the case of Cambridge Analytica. One of the toughest, I would say, page on the newspapers regarding the usage of data. I do believe that many of you, if not all of you, are highly familiar with the case. It was 2018, if I remember correctly, and from one day to another, the world actually realized that, yeah, digital companies have our data and they're using them. Facebook was the one, uh, you know, on the spot in those days. There were many, uh, well, many, I would say all <laughs> the newspapers in the world actually having Facebook and Cambridge Analytica on top of their pages. Just for the ones that maybe don't recall this huge scandal, a couple of words on it. Cambridge Analytica was a, basically a market research company uh, that was doing, among many other things, 
was providing this personality test on Facebook. You know, one of those tests like, what kind of animal are you? That kind of test that in this case, were directly dealing with the personality of people. With a short test, they were getting information on how you think, basically, on what can influence you. And they use this data to profile people and use those information extracted from those data to target them with specific advertisement messages. It seems that this mechanism involved more than 87 million people or around the world. And the reason why all the newspapers in the world were actually you know, talking about this is related to the fact that the, Gar the Observer published um, an article showing how it is possible that there is a direct correlation between the usage of this data and some political events. I'm talking about uh, um, Donald Trump becoming the United uh, States of America, pres the president of the United States of America. I'm talking about the Brexit. And the impact of this information on the public opinion was enormous. Remember 2.5 quintillion bytes of data back in 2012? So years of company using data that saw in those data a lot of value and start using them. And out of nowhere, basically in 2018, the word 7 billion people realizing that yes, digital companies have data and can use them for or somehow against us. The impact of this was pretty relevant. And what was what is now known as the Leave Facebook movement. An hashtag that, by the way, I think it's pretty funny, became popular on Twitter. And uh, uh, was, you know, foreseeing this future where Facebook would have been an empty city. All these people being aware from night to the morning after that Facebook was using their data to do something that was not showing them the feed of their friends. And for a couple of days, I, I do believe that many people, including myself, thought that it was a turning point, that social media wouldn't have been anymore as they were before. Well, this is not actually true. If we look at the number of Facebook users worldwide, they continue growing probably kind of with the same trend. Still, this is one of the many stories that are related that we can talk about. It's definitely not the only one. And I leave the floor to Tommaso to actually let, you, let him tell you another story that are related. Okay, so thank you, Daniel. Yes, it's interesting because, uh, uh, I mean, we had a big scandal and nothing happened. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we had cases in which uh, uh, we didn't have any scandal and nothing happened. Or, but in this case, nothing happened was bad. So um, we, we just finished one study about the uh, uh, contact tracing app, uh, which are, have been developed and used in many countries uh, to trace the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, diffusion. And uh, actually, in Italy, it did not work. It was like a disaster. And um, so if you go to look uh, to uh, articles talking about uh, you know, how many people should actually download and use uh, an application like that uh, in order to have it functioning you know, uh, in a proper way uh, in tracking uh, uh, the, uh, the number of COVID-19 uh, uh, exposed people, uh, normally you find that the number is considered to be around 60%. Uh, in Italy, actually, the um, application was downloaded by just 19.6% uh, of people. So we, we're saying that it was a failure, so it was a disaster. Uh, and interestingly, so we went to look for the roots of this. So what, what, what's the reason for that? And uh, so we discovered some things, but probably the most important one uh, is about uh, privacy which is somehow strange because uh, so you are not concerned uh, or you claim you are concerned about the privacy on Facebook. Uh, there's a big scandal and you do nothing. So you go on using it. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you claim you got a privacy concern uh, about uh, the usage of your data 
for something that is not, you know, fueling uh, a private company, but it's something that is incredibly important uh, for uh, the society, for the economy, economy of your of a country. But in that case, uh, you don't do it. So in that case, you act. In that, in that case, you make something happen because you do not, um, you do not download it. Uh, and this is strange. So there are some cases in which it would make sense uh, to act against, uh, you don't do it. There are some other cases in which uh, doesn't make any sense to act act against and you do it so something is something is interesting here something is strange something is counterintuitive and so uh, we went to to look to some uh cases we said to say okay wait wait a moment so what, what's the point here with uh, uh with privacy uh because uh, in a certain way we don't like we think we don't like uh, these companies using our uh, data uh, but actually the presentation by Pnar before and also some presentations we had the, the second day here at Sim platform uh, they were talking about uh, you know I mean what do we do with this data because in many cases what do what, what actually they do with our data is great so they're doing something for us so this is just one of the many examples that we could take uh, we can make uh, I love I love Spotify and Spotify is actually providing me with uh, uh, a lot of services that I that I really love. I'm in love with so this daily mix thing, or you know, proposing me music that I should love, and it's the same with Amazon that is proposing me things to buy, and I buy a lot of them, and and it's it's the same for many 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 of these um, at Netflix, just just to name one. Uh, so I, in Netflix, I trust. So if Netflix tells me you should look this, um, normally normally I'm happy after after half an hour, uh, which means. Um, that uh, once again, there's something counterintuitive somewhere, something strange. So uh, we love to give data. Uh, we don't love they, to use our data in the wrong way, but we don't change our behavior. And we go on giving them data, but we don't give the data to somebody who's using them for something good. So uh, probably people do not understand the privacy at all. So there's something here that is telling us that these people, us, are not able to completely understand what is happening. So there is another interesting case that is about you know all of this personalization that is given us. We love you know all of this personalization, but still, when it gets to privacy, the behavior of us of people is uh, strange. It's unpredictable. So at a certain point, uh, it was uh, uh, some some uh, uh, I got lost. Okay, in a, at a certain point, it was uh, uh, some uh, uh, some months ago. There was this uh, decision by uh, by WhatsApp uh, to slightly change. Well, I would say heavily change the business model. So the idea is we would like to become a lot more like WeChat. It's not just uh, I don't know if you're familiar with WeChat. It's not just just a place where you can, uh, you know, chat with other people and teams and groups and so on. But it's also a place where business can happen. So you can buy online, they got your credit card numbers, uh, they can profile you, you can directly buy things and services and products uh, from within the application without uh, leaving the application. And this means a lot of money, as you can imagine, in terms of uh, fees uh, on credit card transactions. So they decided to do that. And they announced uh, on January this year, that they were going to change uh, the privacy policies. It's okay, we want to create uh, business uh, accounts. Uh, and uh, do you remember us? So we are the company who wanted to encrypt uh, everything so you can chat uh, and use, uh, and use um, WhatsApp to say whatever things because, uh, you know, uh, the, the messages are encrypted so nobody can get into it, police cannot get into it and so on. So all of a sudden they said, yeah, by the way, we will let you use some of your data. Uh, because we need your data to profile you, because we need to, your data to make you use uh, some services that we, are, that we are developing for you. And the reaction was uh, very strong again. So in this case, the reaction was that uh, all of a sudden, 30 million users uh, joined competitors, Telegram, for example. And, uh, and so at a certain point, they say, okay, wait, 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 what's happening here? Uh, why people are reacting in this way? Why do we do Cambridge Analytica and nothing happens? And then we want to openly, you know, change a business model to do something that is already done by somebody else, uh, which is actually what we already do on Facebook. Uh, and people react in this strange way. So they postponed um, the introduction of these new policies uh, until a few days ago, May 15th, when actually they 
did it. So we decided that we wanted to move on. And so this is somehow opening a, a point uh, that is extremely important for the research we are doing. And the point is, uh, what, is the, what is the role of companies in this? Because uh, uh, we, we, we are making a lot of thinking about you know, people, how do people react, uh, what they understand, uh, what's the concern of privacy, why in some cases is working or work, is not working and so on. But what is the point of companies here? So companies, uh, uh, we think will have to make a decision, probably already now, if it is not now, it's gonna be a very short while. And the decision is, do you wanna be compliant with the regulations? Because Facebook did something not so kosher. But in the case of, uh, in the case of WhatsApp, uh, they didn't do anything irregular. They openly said, this is what we want you to do. So they, they were completely compliant um, with, um, uh, with the rules and regulations. So what's the point of these companies? Do you want to be compliant, uh, but try to be a little bit opaque? You want to be compliant, uh, but still, you know, I'm legally compliant, uh, but I want to, you know, use your data because, you know, I really want to create money out of it without you understanding exactly how it works. Or you want to be accountable, which means, no, I understand that I'm playing a very important role here. I understand that there is a big responsibility in what I'm doing. And I decide to take a stand, to take a position in terms of how I use my data. And what are the implications if I go clear, if I go transparent, if I clearly define a strategy for data transparency, not just being compliant, but clearly taking a position understanding about what do I do with your data? And so starting from this, uh, you know, from this point, we started to ask ourselves what's happening if this company change their policies, moving from I'm compliant to I'm accountable. And Daniel will tell you about some of the results that we obtained with some of the researches we did. Thank you, Tommaso. Well, you know, Tommaso was mentioning many cases, Nara before mentioned many other cases of companies using data and probably in the days before again, and we talked about other platforms that are doing something with our data. And it's interesting to have this discussion, even though we've got people connected a bit from, from everywhere, there are a lot of people connected from Europe. And it's important to say that Europe was probably the body that anticipated the most in the world, this kind of reasoning with the GDPR. Pinar was mentioning it before uh, a couple of minutes ago. But still, this is doing something pretty peculiar. This is asking companies to clearly state what they are planning to do or what they might do with your data and with which data within their privacy policies, which means opening up documents, pretty long documents, where among many other information, you can actually find written somewhere pretty small usually, something about what they might or might not do with your data. And there is a lot of this might. We may do that. We may share this with third parties. Who are third parties? What is a third party? Well, things that are obviously absolutely correct from a legal perspective, from a compliance perspective, but this is not something that I would call transparent. How can those people that was, you know, surprised in 2018 by the fact that Facebook was actually using their data and was part of those hashtag leave a Facebook movement understand what companies can do with their data from the GDPR uh, regulation respected in the privacy policy. What we asked ourselves is what would be the impact of clearly stating to the consumers what they do with data? You know, there are not a lot of companies doing that. There are a couple of companies that if you go on their official website, on top of the services they are offering, you also see that there are services based on data, 
Strava is an amazing example there. If you go on, the, on their website, there is a Strava Metro and they say, we sell data to municipalities to help them building bike lanes in the right place. Okay, this is transparent in my opinion. Probably not the greatest form of transparency I can think of, but it's definitely going in that direction. Still, the number of cases doing so is pretty small. So we entered in a lab. No, I'm joking, we have no labs. But we tried to do some kind of experiments. We tried to create this in our labs. And our lab, for the kind of research we do, it's creating mockups, it's creating fake services that are clearly saying what we would like to do. And we've done some in-field experiments asking people to decide if they would download or not an application giving them a certain set of information or anyhow asking them what kind of actions they would do in front of an application giving those set of information on how they would use and why the data not in the GDPR, not in the, in the privacy policy section, but while they are telling you what they do, while they are trying to convince you that they've got the right offer for your needs. So we've done two experiments. The first one involved more than 500 participants. It was a digital in-field experiment. This means that people saw a mocha, a digital mockup. Of these, uh, um, of these applications. And we created two different mockups of the same service with different brands. So basically uh, they, they were um, fitness applications. They were doing exactly the same thing, but one of them was actually doing it in a transparent way, which is, hey, consumer, do you know why this app is free? For a simple reason, we actually aggregate and make anonymous your data and sell this to pharma companies to, to do better research on how people do sports. And the other one, the opaque one, was compliant with the regulation. So come here, there is this feature, this feature, you know, uh, you can know how fast you run, you can know uh, where you are running, you can challenge with your friends, you can do this and that and so on and so forth. And then if you wish, there is a little button that says privacy policy. And if you click there, after a couple of pages, you will have all the information you're searching for on how we can use your data. And well, the structure of the experiment enable us to let all the participants see both an opaque service and a transparent service. Obviously, ch uh, checking for the order. So half of them saw first the opaque one and half of them saw first the transparent one. And the main goal was trying to understand if people would change their willingness to adopt the service. And well, what we found there is, in our opinion at least, pretty interesting. Overall, the level of transparency, so staying on the transparent one or on the opaque one, does not have any impact on the willingness to adopt. Said in another way, probably your willingness to go for a transparent business model is not harming the potential market that, that you can have. People does not seem to change their idea according to, to this, but it seems that there is an anchoring effect which means that moving from a transparent business model in the first service they've seen to an opaque one in the second one, there is a significant, from a statistical perspective, reduction of their willingness to adopt the service. And we do believe this might have some severe implications. But let me briefly move to the second experiment. Very similar structure, less participants in this case, 312. Digital field experiment again, in this case, three different services in different industries, because we also want to check for the impact that different kinds of data may have on, in terms of transparency, on, on the willingness to, to, in this case, not to adopt, but to disclose, so to share this data with the organization, since one of the main big teams in this, uh, in, this, in this area is actually the control that users have 
on data. This was something emerging in your previous speech as well. And I've seen something in the chat as well. You know, you can ask Facebook, what data do you have on me? You can ask Twitter, can you please delete my data? This is something coming again by law. We, we have, we must have control on our data. And we we're willing to understand if these different levels of transparency are actually having an impact on the willingness to give data to the organization and to the level of trust that we have towards that, that organization. And in this case, we found out that yes, different level of transparency, so moving towards transparency has a positive impact, both on the willingness to disclose data and to the trust towards the platform. This is pretty interesting. It may mean that being transparent can help companies in creating a different kind of relationship with users and potentially to have even more data in the future. Still, uh, the sensitivity of data, so the field we were, we were actually controlling for, seems to have only a partial effect, so it's not really changing the dimensions. I was very briefly presenting two of our latest studies, but what I'd like to discuss with you are the implications of these results. Leaving aside, you know, the theory part and the literature part, trying to understand what they mean for people taking decision on how to use the data. And we believe that the Kano model can actually be a good support for that. You know, the Kano model is that model that tell us that services have different features that may lead to different outcomes. There are something that is at the lighter, so you're not expecting it. But if it's there, you're extremely happy about it. There are linear performers, you know, those things that you are the happier, the better it is the feature. And then there are the must have. Those things that if they are there, you don't even realize they are there. But if they are not, well, you're definitely pissed off about it. And, you know, our data seem to suggest that right now, transparency can be a lighter. So if people start realizing that transparency can exist, they start appreciating it. Someone, probably not anyone in the market, but still someone is seeing greatest value in it. Do you recall the shift I was mentioning, moving from transparent to opaque? So what happened if after seeing a transparent service, you go back to an opaque one. Well, in that case, the willingness to adopt the service was dropping down. This means that once transparency may become somehow dominant or evident, at least in the market, transparency can quickly become a must-have. We are in the year of disruption. This shift may not take decades. This may mean that companies will be to take decisions pretty soon if they want to lead this kind of transformation rather than, you know, follow it because someone else took a decision. And on this, I will leave the floor to Tommaso for, for the closing. Okay, so uh, and then the last thing that we would like to share with you uh, it's not about uh, our researches and what we found, uh, but it's more a sort of perspective about uh, about the future and what uh, uh, we would like to propose a different way to look at the problem. Um, I guess that many of you are familiar with uh, a Netflix show that was called The Social Dilemma. Uh, so probably you saw it, you know, there are all these people who are working, Facebook and other companies, uh, and they are telling how bad they are because they, they take our data, they make a lot of things with our data. And uh, I think that uh, uh, this is somehow the kind of dominant storytelling that we are looking at in this period. So the dominant storytelling is uh, the one of, uh, of a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can uh, take my data and use my data, and the, more, the less you, you use my data, the more you, la you love me, the more you use my data, the more money you do, and there's like this uh, 
trade-off, uh, which is coming from a way of looking at the problem, but it's basically binary. So it's, it's, it's based on the philosophy of, uh, of scarcity. So there is something here, the more I give to you, because I let you understand what I do with my data and stuff like that, uh, the more I give to you, the less is for me. So companies are living this, we, we expect, we think, uh, this is once again, the main storytelling, that companies are living this trade-off. So the more I tell you what I do with that, the less I can do with it. Uh, the less I let you know, the more I can do with it. So it's like, you know, the more I gain, the more you lose. Uh, but uh, we actually think that uh, it's not a social dilemma. It is a dilemma. It should be a dilemma. It will be. Okay. It is a dilemma. Uh, and when we talk about dilemma, we talk about dilemma, we talk about uh, the prisoner dilemma. So what's, what's the idea here? When you switch from the framework point of view, uh, you, when you switch from um, a, a, a trade-off to a dilemma, you are actually completely changing the way in which you think, uh, which means that instead of having, you know, just two dimensions, you start opening to different uh, possibilities. So you abandon at a certain point uh, the basic thinking of the more I win, the more you lose. And you might uh, find uh, new spaces uh, for new possible decisions uh, that might uh, bring to a win-win. And uh, being sincere, we already saw that in history. Uh, if we get back you know, some 20 years ago, uh, what we find was the main idea of sustainability. And at the beginning, it was exactly like we are living the data, uh, the data dilemma, the data trade-off today. So uh, the more I get green, the more I need to spend, so I will gain less money. It is the right thing to do, but you know my competitors might take advantage for that and so on. So that was the way to see it. But we developed in the last years uh, different kind of approaches. So I don't know if you're familiar with the case, but it's a palm, the palm um, oil round table. So you got um, that many different uh, actors in the supply chain, producers, transporters, users of palm oil actually join together and they agree about behaving in a different way. And this is not actually creating a, you know, a situation in which they gain less because they are doing the right thing and uh, the customer is happier. Actually, the situation they are creating is a situation in which uh, everybody is winning because you are abandoning this idea of the more I gain, the more you lose, and you get to an abundancy uh, kind of attitude. That is, uh, let's find new things we could do to create even more value with all of this data. And once we got more value with this data, we can share it. And at the end of the day, everybody you know, in the game might win more than before. Uh, this happened with sustainability and uh, our perception, our, for, for, we do foresee somehow that this might happen with uh, data transparency in the, next, uh, in the next future. And there are some things uh, that are telling us that this might be the case. For example, uh, you might be familiar with this idea of greenwashing. So companies that pretend uh, or try to appear as green, even if they are not, so they are not actually having still, you know, the trade-off. I, I, I try to get more market because I, I'm seen as green, but I'm not on the other side actually doing something. So I do not have uh, higher costs. I, you know, more appealing for the customer, ha ha, and I will get out uh, with it. Uh, and we see that something is happening like this already in data. Uh, because many companies are actually, you know, claiming uh, that they are absolutely transparent, uh, that you can do whatever you want with their data. Uh, think about Facebook, as we said before. So you can do whatever you want. You can see which kind of data they've got. You can even ask them cancelling. But that is hidden somewhere. So you need, really need to know that you can do that. You really need to know that what you can do. And uh, you really need to want to do that. So this is, once again, this is compliancy. This is not accountability. So our idea is that uh, some companies might decide uh, to become accountable of this thing, abandoning the basic idea of a trade-off uh, and embracing uh, the more complex idea of a dilemma. And this might change the game. And if uh, 
what Daniel said before is going to be true. If uh, we can apply the Cano model, probably these companies will set a new standard to which our companies will have to at least comply. Because otherwise, uh, they will be considered not uh, you know, transparent enough. So this is what we expect to happen. We don't know if it's going to happen for real, but this is where our researchers are you know, driving us in this, uh, in this period. And we hope you enjoy that.